Greetings and welcome to Unit 4, where we're going to talk specifically about ancient China. Ancient China is again one of the oldest civilizations, a curry starting civilization about a thousand years after those civilizations of Mesopotamia and Egypt. So why don't we get started? We have five terms for this particular lesson that we're going to talk about. We got Laos, Oracle Bone, Mandate of Heaven, Dynastic Cycle, and Feudalism. Please make sure you are aware of these terms. I am going to refer to them in our lesson here, and you are expected to know what it is as I talk about them. So let's get started. Uh, we'll start with a little bit of the ge geographic information and go into the history. So here we go. Here's a satellite image of present-day China. If you've done your geography assignments already, you'll know and recognize some of the areas. Here on the northern part, we have what would be considered the Gobi Desert. It kind of is a combination of the northern part of China, and it actually goes into present-day Mongolia. On the west, we have the huge desert here, known as the, let's see if I pronounce this right, the Kalamikan Desert. Kalamikan Desert. Huge desert takes up about half, almost two-thirds, of the entire country of China. Over here on the east, you might recognize this little peninsula here. This is the Korean Peninsula that makes up both North and South Korea. Right across the sea there, you have Japan. You don't see all of Japan there, but you see a little portion of it there. And down to the south here, this little island down here, way at the bottom, uses a different color, would be Taiwan. Taiwan has been in kind of a debate lately as in regards to who actually owns it. China says it's owned by them. Taiwan says it's an independent thing. Pretty much they leave each other alone, even though technically I believe China is the people that, that are rightfully claimed to it. So, a little bit of the history now. Make sure you have your notes available as well, because this goes right with your notes. So, setting the stage. China's first cities were built about a thousand years after the fall of Ur. If you remember, Ur was the region in Mesopotamia, first civilizations, as well as a thousand years before uh, the Great Pyramids and other planned cities on the Indus rivers in India, which we just studied. Unlike most civilizations and cultures on Earth, uh, civilization began about 4,000 years ago in China, and it still thrives today. It is the only real civilization that we can track back 4,000 years that still exists today. Not too many can say that about their civilization. It's still going on today. The geography of China. China has natural boundaries all around it. It's isolated because of all these different boundaries. You've got deserts on the west. You've got oceans on the east. You've got the Gobi Desert to the north. To the south, it's a little different because it's broken up into some smaller nations, which used to be part of the China, the entire China continent or, or country, but uh, they've broken up into their own country. So the only real non-natural barrier is to the south. Other than that, it's, it's deserts and oceans that surround and mountains as well, that surround the region. Again, desert 15,000 foot plateau of the Tibet, in Tibet, the Talmikian Desert, the Himalayas on the southwest, which separates India from China, as well as uh, Nepal, to the north, the Gobi Desert, and the mountain ranges and deserts dominate two-thirds of China's landmass. This map kind of depicts the time period of about 4,000 to 3,000 years ago where the majority of the civilization of China occurred. This shaded brown area here is the main region we're talking about where civilization started in this part of the world. As with all the other civilizations we've talked about so far, the river systems were extremely important to the survival of Chinese civilization. Here we're actually seeing an image of the Hanghe River, 
which is in the north part of China. What makes this unique is, and you can tell by the pictures below, is it actually deposits a large amount of Laos. Basically, it's, it's just dust that flies with the wind and lands in the water. The water looks brown because the desert winds have blown all that Laos into the water, and it's just flowing down river. Looks kind of nasty, but it's basically just dirt or silt. And you can kind of see the path that the river flows here. It starts up in the top here, over by present day Beijing, a little bit south of there. Runs up and down to the northern portion and back down into the middle of China. Very important river system. There are some offshoots of that river, but most of it's it's it's, it's a pretty wide, pretty uh, long river. Another river system we have is the Yangtze's, is how we'd pronounce it. It's the Changjiang, uh, which is in central Ch central China. It flows east from the Yellow Sea, and is about three thousand nine hundred and eighty-eight miles long. It is the longest river in Europe as well. Oh, sorry, the largest river in Asia. I apologize. Environmental challenges. The river is just like in Mesopotamia and the Nile and the Indus River systems which we've talked about. They flood. Uh, same thing happened here in China. So a lots of flooding causes natural disasters for those civilizations along these rivers. Because of this, it make tr makes trade difficult, uh, so settlers be had to become self-dependent. Couldn't get a lot of stuff in, couldn't get a lot of stuff out because of the mountainous area and the uncertainty of the rivers and transporting on the rivers. So they kind of had to fend for themselves. Subsistence farming primarily, where they had to grow their own stuff to survive it for themselves. Geography did not make invasion impossible, though. Only 10% of China's land is suitable for farming. Most of the farmable land is on North China's plain between the Yellow River and the Yangtze River. As you can see on this map here, about half to two-thirds of the entire country is... Uh, you can't do any agriculture on it because of deserts, mountain regions, things like that. These green areas, the darker the green, the more agriculture they can do. And the reason for the lighter green is, is those are mountainous areas. You can do some agriculture, but nothing on a huge, massive scale. Lots of rock, lots of hills that don't make agriculture realistic. All right, let's get into some of the history. Early dynasties here. This map is showing us East China, right across from the Eastern China Sea, between uh, butted up against the Yellow Sea. We've got two different dynasties that were some of the first recorded dynasties in history. There was a dynasty before this. There was no written di record of it. It's tradition. Or, uh, it's mentioned in stories. But these two we actually have documents for. The Shang Dynasty and the Zhao Dynasties. And you can kind of see here what areas that they controlled. The Zhao and the, Zhang, the, Zhao and the Shang cultures actually are very similar to each other. Even though they were ruled by two different dynasties or families, there really wasn't a lot of a dif lot of difference between the two and how they ruled, as well as how they ended up failing. The development of Chinese culture. Fossils show that modern humans lived in southwest China about 1.7 million years ago. According to legend, the first Chinese dynasty the Jia Dynasty started about 2000 BC, 4,000 years ago. Chinese viewed everyone outside their culture as barbarians. They viewed themselves as the center of civilized world, so everybody else was just uncivilized or barbaric. The Chinese name for China was Middle Kingdom, so they're between the heavens and, I guess, what would be considered hell or, or the uh, under civilization, under kingdom. Family is central to Chinese society. Respect for one's parents is huge. Women were treated inferior, and the girls were to be married off 
by the time they were between 13 and 16 years old. It actually got so bad in some places where girls, as, as they would have to be married off, do the household chores, totally inferior, and as the males, the boys grew up, it got to the point where the boys would actually have to tell their mothers what to do. They would have more authority than their own mothers as they got up in age. So it's very much a male-dominated society. Uh, the religion. Spirits of their ancestors had power to bring good fortune, not seen as gods. They're seen as spirits. If any of you have seen the cartoon or the, the Disney movie Mulan, they kind of talk about that in the beginning, where the family goes to the spirit of the family, the spirit male sides of the family, to help them get Mulan to be successful and, and be safe. Just as a little example. The use of oracle bones. Priests scratching questions on bones. They apply a hot poker. And the bone would split, and these priests would interpret the cracks. Interesting type of uh, religion, if you ask me. If they did things they didn't understand, this is one religious practice that they would do. There were no links between spoken and written language. One could read Chinese without being able to speak it. All parts of China learned the same system of writing, even if they spoke different languages, thus unifying parts of China. Needed to know 1,500 characters to be considered literate. Scholars knew more than 10,000 characteristics or characters. You want to kind of relate this to like numbers and letters in, in our system of, of English. You could understand numbers and not understand words. Vice versa, if we say like the number one, try to explain the number one to somebody without spelling it. You know, you can explain it without having to spell it out. Okay, it's kind of the same thing here. And here are just some uh, alphabetical symbols that they used that we've been able to translate. The Zhao Dynasty's contributions, as you can see, this is kind of the region we were looking at a few seconds ago. The Zhao and Dynastic Cycle. In 1027 BC, a people called the Zhao overthrew the Shang. They were culturally similar, however. The Zhao believed in a mandate of heaven or divine approval to rule. The Mandate of Heaven became central to the Chinese view of government. This helped explain the dynastic cycle, a pattern of rise, decline, and replacement of the dynasties, if the spirit did not approve of one king's rule. This is how they explained or justified being able to kick one dynasty or family out of the ruling, uh, ruling people. Um, and we'll see a little bit of example of, of that cycle in a second here. The Mandate of Heaven says that a dynasty was chosen by some sort of God or some sort of higher authority to take over the previous dynasty. As you can see here, they're founded, they relieve this mandate, which is like an order from the spirits or the God to take over and rule the people. And for a while, as you can see, they do great. People like it. The, the dynasty is successful. But as societies get more successful or governments get more successful, they want more power. And that's when the people start losing faith in their government. And you start the inevitable decline. And soon you get to that decline, and at the bottom is where the next dynasty steps in and says, okay, I have this new mandate from God, and I'm going to take over, and the whole thing starts all over again. Here's kind of another way of putting it in a different kind of a chart, but it's ultimately the same thing. I'll give you a second here to 
pause and review this. All right. The Zhao and the dynastic cycle. The use of royal families controlling different regions was known as feudalism. The Zhao dynasty innovated roads, canals, they coined money, as well as blast furnaces. The Zhao were generally peaceful people, though. Later years, the Zhao dynasties were known as a warring states uh, during a certain period of time because of the weakened power of the kings. Uh, they were attacking nomads and greedy lords. We'll see feudalism when we get into his history in Europe, but it pretty much kind of started around this period, where the king would, the king and the lords, which were the rich guys, would divvy up their land to the peasants. And in return, the peasants promised to help with any military act that the king required or that the lord required. And that's what feudalism is. And as you can see, during the warring period, lots of different smaller states came about. The king or the, the, the ruler of the dynasty did not have a lot of power. It ultimately became where the lords had the power of their specific regions, their areas. And this map kind of indicates that during this time span of about 50 years. As a result, China's culture had been shaped by the geography surrounding its people. A highly evolved culture that began with the Xia, the Shang, and the Zhao dynasties will become one of the world's oldest. This unique people will be regularly disrupted by the rise and fall of governments that will later be known as the dynastic cycle. Our studies in this unit will focus on five of those dynasties. The Qin, the Han, the Tang, the Song, and the Yang. And there you have it. Feel free to go back and look at this video again if you have any other questions or you might have missed something. You can also contact Mr. Vincent for any clarifying points. And finally, all the notes and information for this unit are on the SLC website. Feel free to look there as often as you need. And I hope you got something out of this little lesson. Have a great day.